um, I want to start with a question this morning. What do, you, what do you do when you cannot fix what's wrong? I mean, there's some, something's gone wrong in your life, something significant. And what is, I'm not talking about the toaster, okay? I'm not talking about something. What do you do when you cannot fix what's wrong? I've been in that situation before. I know you have. If you've been around any time at all, maybe, maybe that's you right now. Things you just can't fix. I wanted to share an email with you uh, written by a young mom. She says this, I'm 29 years old. I have two girls, seven and five. And last year, my husband divorced me after six years of marriage. He's always late with child support and bills are piling up. I've been diagnosed recently with stage three breast cancer. I'm tired. I'm afraid. I'm angry. I don't know if I have a future. I don't know if my daughters will have a mother. Evenings I come, I take care of my kids. And and, and when they go to bed, I just cry but there's nobody there to hold me when I cry. Sometimes I drink until I go to sleep. Nobody cares. I'm sinking. There's nobody to catch me. I feel like I'm about to collapse. I'm so stressed out and tired, like I could just lay down and never get up. I feel hurt and ashamed and resentful. I can scarcely react or relate to any other person anymore. I feel hopeless. Now, somebody here can relate to that. Somebody here can relate to that. And you're thinking, that's me. Or a big part of that's me. But everybody, if we're honest with ourselves, can see something of this in here that, that's, that's us. You know? We've been walking around saying, Happy Easter. It's not happy. It's hard. You can't fix what's wrong. You don't know what to do. (coughs) 17th of December, 1927, just off the coast of Massachusetts, the American submarine USS S-4 was accidentally rammed and sunk by a Coast Guard destroyer. Coast Guard started... Rescue operations immediately, just, I mean, immediately over the hours. Sailors that were trapped in this forward torpedo room uh, uh, communicated a series of signals tapping on the hull. And as those trapped sailors used the last available oxygen in the sub, they tapped out in Morse code. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? It's a question asked every day. I mean, it's asked in the doctor's office. It's, it's asked as you're awaiting tests. It's at home when you're awaiting the results. It's standing by a hospital bed. It's driving to see a counselor. It's sitting in jail after another DUI. It's seated in a grave. Is there hope? You know, when, you're, when your child is missing or you're, you, you're seeing the ICU doors close behind you or the doctor walks into the family waiting room and he's got an entire message on his face already. You got that same question maybe in the back of your mind today. Am I ever going to be happy? Am I ever going to be settled? You suffered a setback in your health, a setback in your job. You know, you got finances all messed up. Feels like you're in a hole you'll never be able to climb out of. You, you wonder if there's anything else to look forward to gone through a divorce, lost a family member, doctor told you cancer, you didn't hear anything after that. I mean, is there any, is there any hope? Is there any hope? Or maybe you hear this question and you're thinking, is there any relevance? I mean, my career's going great. My family's healthy. We're doing wonderful. I'm getting along with my spouse. You know, everything's just great. I mean, is there any relevance Uh, here today. You know, everything's going well. I want to suggest today that if you're the one that hears, is there any hope? And you're asking, is there any relevance? Maybe you just sort of hang on to this message because I promise you, you're going to want this. You're going to need this at some point. Hard times come to everybody. 
And when they come to you, you're going to be just like the rest of us. And the relevance is going to be painfully clear. And you're going to be scrambling around for hope. Is there any hope? Well, I, I hear the question, Randy. I hear the question, but I, I don't even really even get the meaning. What, what do you mean by hope? Well, hope in the Christian sense <clears throat> is this. It's the expectation of future blessing and the confidence that the best is yet to come. It's the expectation of future blessing and the confidence that the best is, is yet to come. Now, this is not talking about health and wealth and cars and mansions, and you're not going to move on to West Paces Ferry and live beside whoever lives there. <laughs> That's not going to happen in your life, right? You know, if you've been watching those TV preachers that say that you're going to get everything you want, and that's the Christian hope. You know, they kind of have private jets and all that stuff. Well, you, you know, you probably already know that that's a lie. You probably already do. God doesn't promise us health and wealth here and now. He just doesn't. This is a broken place we live in, in case we haven't, in case we haven't seen that yet. But God does promise blessing. And sometimes it gives you health, and sometimes it gives you wealth. Not for your comfort, but for your ministry, right? So it can be leveraged for other people. Uh, God, But God does have this for your life today. The best is yet to come. If you're willing to trust Jesus with your life right now, there is hope. We're going to look today at uh, the Apostle John's account of the Easter events. There are four Gospels. You probably know this. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have a sort of biography-like uh, writing about uh, Jesus and um, tells his life story. John was, uh, is the author of the book we're going to look at. He was one of Jesus' closest friends, heard about him a minute ago. He traveled with Jesus throughout his entire ministry, right up to the cross. He saw it all. We're going to read Revelation 20, uh, beginning at verse 11, but before that, the first uh, 10 verses um, began very early in the morning. Now, this is Easter Sunday. Nobody called it Easter Sunday yet, okay? But this was, this was Easter Sunday. It was the very first one. You know, on Friday, Jesus had been crucified, put to death by the Romans, hastily buried. They didn't get to prayer his body really very well, and, and that was Friday. This is Sunday, and a woman, Mary Magdalene, uh, went to the tomb and discovered the stone to the tomb had been rolled away, been moved, and, and maybe that scared her, probably did. Uh, so she took off running back to the disciples, and she said, somebody's taking Jesus' body out of the tomb. We, we don't know what they did with him. Well, two of them, two of the disciples, Peter and John, I mean, they just take off running to the tomb. You know, John wrote the gospel, so he adds a little detail, I won the race, you know. You can read that later. I guess if you know Peter had gotten off his behind and written a gospel, he could have put in his version of the race in there. I don't think he'd done that. But yeah, well, they run, they race. John arrives first. They, um, Peter goes into the tomb first, and they see the burial fabrics that Jesus' body was raised in, uh, wrapped in, lying there on the tomb. They still didn't understand that he'd been raised from the dead. They didn't get it. So. Peter and John look around. They don't see Jesus, and they leave. They go back to where the disciples were, uh, where they were staying. Mary doesn't leave. She doesn't arrive as quickly as the guys. They ran the whole way. Uh, but she arrives, and she doesn't leave. Verse 11 says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, who often in the Bible appear uh, as human beings, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. You know, there are six women in the Bible named Mary. If you don't know which one this is, that's okay. Uh, but this is, you know, the one, Mary from Magdala, Mary Magdalene. Uh, she and a, a group of other women traveled around with Jesus, with the disciples. They were part of the traveling ministry team. And, and Luke's gospel tells us that Jesus had delivered her from demons. She'd been demon-possessed. Strong tradition says that she'd worked as a prostitute. We don't know that for sure. Uh, what we do know that is this. Her life had been a wreck until Jesus put her back together. Uh, and she's crying. 
She, she's weeping. The word wept here in this text suggests loud wailing. This isn't somebody that has a little tissue, you know, a tear or two, and sniffles, you know, trying to cat, you know, control their emotions. She is weeping, sobbing loudly. They, the angels, verse 13, asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. She didn't realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? I don't know why she didn't recognize Jesus. Maybe it says she was sobbing. Maybe her eyes were full of tears. Maybe she's like most of us when she was crying. She's looking down. She's aware of somebody standing there. Maybe she was just so not expecting to see Jesus alive after having seen him dead on the cross that she looked right at him and didn't recognize him. I have no idea. It doesn't say. But what we do know is that Jesus <clears throat> asked her then, why are you crying? Why are you crying? A lot of things we could discuss here. But I, just, I don't want us to miss the big picture. A lot of great details. Maybe we'll do that another time. But I don't want, I don't want you to miss the big thing. He did not miss her grief. He saw her grief. <clears throat> I mean, he saw that. He, he had turned her life around. He had given her purpose where she had none. He'd given her <clears throat> freedom where she'd been held captive. He was her friend, her teacher, the one who had become her purpose, and he had died. And Jesus saw her sorrow. That's the big picture. But here's a bigger one still. He sees your sorrow. No matter where you are in your life, what you're struggling with, what it is, what's eating you up inside, what you're afraid of, the hurt, the pain, the anger, the scars that you carry, Jesus sees your sorrow. He, he sees yours, not just the world's sorrow, you know? I mean, he sees it, but it's not just, we're not talking about the world, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. He sees your sorrow. He sees, he sees mine. He sees, Jesus is aware. He sees that your life, generally speaking, if you're an ordinary, regular human being, is an orchestrated denial of death. He sees the sadness that you have to face, especially about the truth of your own mortality. You know, and... You know, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists say that's a good bit of what we're crying about when we go to funerals. Maybe not even consciously, but we're weeping over the death of the person we love, but we're also weeping over the fact that we too are mortal. You know, he, he sees your sorrow. He sees you crying because you've been hurt and disappointed and betrayed, that you're working and your back is just breaking. He sees your sadness over the fact that that you're not living like an angel and you're trying hard to make other people think you are. He sees that you've done some things you can't undo. You've developed habits and addictions you can't escape and cannot even bear to look at the ones that you have hurt. He sees your broken heart. Huh. Over a broken faith that you're not sure even exists anymore and it leaves you feeling more alone and more overwhelmed. And it's not just that Jesus sees. It's that Jesus sees. It's that he's the one who sees you. He's the one who understands. It reminds me of a, uh, a picture that I saw one time about a burned out old cabin um, uh, out in the woods, old shack, really, and all that was left was the chimney. I drive around in southwest Virginia, where I'm from, on the back roads, and I'll see half a dozen of those in an afternoon. I mean, just all over the place, and, and a lot of you've seen them. And, and in front of this picture, um, the artist <clears throat> presents an older man, grandfather-looking man, dressed only in his underclothes, like long johns, probably would say, and with a small boy clutching onto some patched overalls, and the boy's crying. It's clear. Underneath the pictures were words that the artist felt that the old man was speaking to the boy, and they were simple words. 
but profound theology uh, and a great way to look at life. The words said, hush child, God ain't dead yet. He's not. Our God is alive. And Easter Sunday reminds us of that. The one who knows you best, loves you most, is the one who sees you most clearly. Moving on, the text, thinking he was the gardener, she, Mary, said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary? She turned toward him, cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, Rabboni, which means teacher. It comes from the word rabbi, but it's a more personal, a sort of intimate, it's close friends, it's, it's dearest teacher would be the way we might translate it literally. <clears throat> Can you imagine, and I know you have, uh, imagined hearing your name called from the lips of one that you lost and loved so much? Would you like to hear that again? I'd like to hear that again. You know, I want to remind you today, even though it's not the topic of this message, uh, you're going to hear that. Uh, if you're in Christ and you, your family member is in Christ, you'll have a reunion one day, and they will call your name. And you will experience that joy, the thing that you've longed for. That's what Mary heard. He knew her name. That's, that's personal. Uh, and, and she... The sheep knew his voice. That's what the Bible says happens. But Easter reminds us the resurrected Lord calls more names than those back then. He calls your name uh, now. He calls your name. He, he sees you and he calls you. He wants you to know that he's with you. He sees your sorrow. He knows your name. You know, he, he understands you know, when I was a kid, my mama would call me, and depending on how things were going between me and mama, it would either be Randall Allen Barnhart, in which case I ran for the neighbor's house, right? Uh, no, I would have been capital punishment if I had done that. Um, but if, you know, she just said, Randy, I could tell. I could tell. I don't think Jesus called Mary like that, with that soft, welcoming tone. I think he understood that she needed it. I think he understands that you need it. And if you will listen to your heart and open it up to the message of God today, I believe you will hear him calling your name today where you sit. You'll hear him calling. He wants you to know that you really do matter. And that's why he calls you by name. You know, Jesus come and say, hey, y'all. That'd be pretty awesome. You know? But to hear him say, Chris. <laughs> to, hear, to hear him say, Todd. To hear him say, uh, Sarah. To hear him say, Louise. To hear him say, Tony. To hear him say your name. I mean, goodness gracious. You know, Mary was so excited. I mean, she just like, I think my picture of this is she just like dove at Jesus' ankles and is holding him. I don't know what happened, but she did something. She takes hold of him apparently because in verse 17, Jesus says, do not hold on to me. It's like, don't grasp on to me without letting go. You know, don't hold on to me for I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brother's and tell them, I am ascending to my Father, and to your Father, to my God, and to your God. There's, there's a ton there. And, you know, the food's going to get cold. Um, but I want to say this. I want to make this really clear. Jesus commissions Mary to be the first messenger. Go and, and tell. Let them know well, what you've seen. I'm alive. I'm going to be going to my Father uh, to your God, my God, you know? <clears throat> you know, some people think that these resurrection accounts are fiction or that they're metaphor or that there's some sort of image, you know, and, you know, that kind of thing. But here's a strong piece of evidence that this is history. 
and that the author intends it to be read as history. Um, Jesus assigns the first big role to a woman. And you might think, well, why is that uh, proof? Well, because it's called an admission against interest. It's saying something that does not serve your case. If the earliest Christians wanted everybody to believe the good news, and we know that they did, and if women were not considered trustworthy in courts of law or somebody that you would ever put up, you know, to say, you can, you can trust me because, you know, she said so. I mean, it works against your interest to put her out there as the primary, the primary uh, or the first witness. So here's why they included it that way, because it happened that way. It's history. We're reading history here. Well, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. Uh, she's so thrilled. And she told him that, you know, she, uh, that he'd said these things to her. A dead man, now alive. Everything has changed. Uh, death is now dead. Victory is possible in your life and in mine. Uh, and beyond our lives, you have nothing to fear in life or in death if you are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you've got everything to fear. But it's not necessary because his arms are extended, open, inviting uh, you today. And I got to tell you the truth. He offers you hope. And he sent me here today to tell you about it. Your hope. You see, every one of us uh, is terminal. I know we don't like to think about it. Man, we deny this. Uh, some of us are are <clears throat> dead or dying right now. Kind of mixing that up just a little bit, but you know what I'm saying? Deep down, you were created for more, <clears throat> but physically, every one of us, if, 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 if unless Christ returns first, every one of us is going to face physical death. Maybe years from now. Maybe moments from now. Uh, we don't know. Few people ever do. What we do know is that death is coming. And it's possible to face your death with great confidence. Not because you've lived a good life. No offense, but you haven't. And neither have I. There's only one standard that matters. And it's the standard of Jesus Christ. And it is perfection. None of us have done that. None of us have lived the good life, but he did. And then Jesus died the death that we earn with our lives so that we might live the life that he gives us by his death. And it's a life of hope. I don't know how you've heard of Michael Faraday, one of the most influential scientists in history, groundbreaking work in chemistry and in physics. And here's how great Michael Faraday was. Albert Einstein had a picture of Michael Faraday on his wall, Okay. This was a dude, even though he's not as well known. Faraday was a committed Christian. When he lay dying, a journalist asked for a final interview and questioned Faraday. And at one point he said, what are your speculations about a life after death? The great scientist said, speculations? <laughs> I know nothing of speculations. I'm resting on certainties. I know that my Redeemer lives. And because he lives, I'm going to live also. Hope. Hope. He offers you hope. You know, one of the most influential men of the 20th century was the Russian Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And I don't know if you've read his stuff. He wrote the great Gulag Archipelago where he talks about being in the, the Soviet gulags for so many years, suffering and Forced labor, hard labor, every single day without fail, ever, irrespective of the day of the week, irrespective of the weather, every day, all day, it was brutal. And it was so awful for years. All they had to look forward to was just a little bit of mush for dinner and hard labor, slow starvation, sun up to sundown, seven days a week he worked out there. One day he literally gave up. He, he gave up living. He felt no purpose. He didn't see any reason to go on. Uh, life in the camp made no sense. Uh, he, he lay his shovel down. He walked over a bench and he sat down. Now he knew that they were not allowed to sit down. 
and he would be told to stand. And if he did not stand and get back up and work, the guard was very likely to take his own shovel and beat him to death with it. He had seen it numerous times. So he's sitting there waiting for the death that he knew was coming. And all of a sudden he felt the presence over him. When I first heard the story, I thought, Jesus. No, it's not. It was, a, it, was a, it was an old, very old prisoner who'd been there a, a long time, many, many years. Here's a Solzhenitsyn as a prisoner, uh, as a dad, and then later uh, the great writer. Uh, but this man standing over him there in the prison, um, he looked up and, and uh, he didn't say anything. Neither one of them spoke. And he said, man, looked at him without any expression whatsoever kind of face that's just kind of hard to do, no expression, just staring at him. And he took a stick, and in the sand under Solzhenitsyn's feet, he just drew a picture. Of a cross. Solzhenitsyn says he stared at that sign. His entire perspective shifted. He was not one man against the entire Soviet Union, cut off from everything that matters. He was reminded that he was not alone, that his hope, our hope, is the death of Christ, and then death defeated by Christ. Solzhenitsyn's deliverance, <clears throat> like yours, is the greatest power in all the universe, and it is on display on Easter Sunday. And he sees your sorrow, he calls your name, and he offers you hope. Whatever struggles you are in, whatever difficulties you face, consider this. In three days, three days, the, the friends and family of Jesus went from hopelessness to hopeful. They went from despair uh, to celebration. They went from defeat to victory. They went from weeping to witnessing. Because the cross of Jesus and his empty tomb bring hope. It's offered to you today. We're going to sing a song after I pray. And I want to tell you this much. This is the one day that I'm going to say, don't diversify. Put all your eggs in one basket and you can have hope. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We praise you in his name. And we ask, Lord, that you would use the word of resurrection, a word of hope, not just to encourage us, but to change us. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen.